Ah, here I am up in the middle of the forest. I love being in the forest, I can't help it. Something about being in mama nature is just a delight. Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I'm going to show you some chess ideas from one of my favorite authors, Jeremy Silman. Of course, I always go with Jeremy Silman because he is such a phenomenal instructor. So it's time to quit looking at the trees and begin to look at, ta-da, the chessboard. <laughs> uh, hey, I can't help it. I love being alive. I like having fun, so you're just going to have to put up with my idiot secrecies. Silman, in his texts, has elaborated extensively on the various chess imbalances. The beautiful thing he does, in my opinion, is he shows us, by illustration, what imbalances are and how to deal with them. We end up with this particular situation. There's been a few moves made. What Silman asks us to do now is find the imbalances and find the strategy, find the move that the next player has to make in order to take advantage of those imbalances. Because every game has imbalances. Sometimes you can have three or four imbalances all at once. So by learning how to read the board, we learn how to play better chess because the logic, the impeccable logic is, you play where the imbalances are that favor you. See, this is simple. This is Mickey Mouse chess, right? Absolutely. White, analyzing White's position here, because of his two pawns here, he has more space in the center. Can you see that? Black has less space in the center. White has more room toward the center. He also has a lead in development. He has more pieces placed out in the field than black does. Right? That's another imbalance. Now, a lead in development can, if you don't take advantage of that, it can disappear. Your opponent will eventually catch up. Just so you understand that. So far as we can see, there are no weaknesses in White's camp. And I know you're looking, you're saying, hey, wait a minute, dude, there's a, a black pawn right there and he's threatening that bishop, so there is a weakness. No, that's not a weakness. What he means by a weakness is a long-term weakness. Black isn't as fortunate, and here's the interesting illustration that'll help us see what a weakness is. There's none in white, but the black side has a couple of weaknesses. The c7 square here is a weak square. The d5 square here is a weak square, and it has to be watched because that's a central square, right? And the d6 pawn is weak. Now, what does he mean by this? Why does he say this square is weak? Because there's no pawns either occupying that square, or all of the pawns are advanced, or the pawn next to it can't support that square. Because of the pawn moves that have been made, this is a weak square. Only a power can control that square. And you're I know what you're saying. You're saying, wait a minute, dude. He's got the queen covering that square. What do you mean it's weak? The strongest player in the whole game? And you're saying this square is weak. Yes, because the weaknesses is caused by the lack of pawns. This is what makes a square weak. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, on this square, the d5 square, that is also weak. And you're saying, that's idiotic. He's got a knight covering that square. No, that doesn't make this square strong. The reason this square is weak 
is because this pawn has already gone past. If this pawn was here, then it would be covering this square and the f5 square, the d5 and the f5, right? But because black has pushed a pawn, every time you push a pawn, you create a weakness. Were you aware of that? Now, that don't freak out. Don't stop pushing pawns <laughs> because you have to. You know what I mean? So by coming here, he has passed this square that supports that square. And this other pawn has been exchanged. It's gone. So he has no pawn to come to here to protect that square also. You see how that works? So this is also a weak square. Now, a weak square, white can eventually occupy this square with a knight. And that's an outpost. You see how that works? This is why these are weak squares. Because of the pawn structure of black, he has this weakness, this weakness, and he says this d6 is a weak pawn. Again, using the same reasoning, the reason this pawn is weak is because he doesn't have a pawn here to back him up. Does that make sense? This pawn is already advanced past this pawn. So on either side of this pawn, he has no support. Therefore, this is a weak pawn. And what does that tell us? That means white, if you are playing white, you have targets. Right? You now know that's a weak pawn. He's going to have to defend his pawn with one of his powers. You can attack that pawn with one of your powers, and you can tie him down to a defense of these weaknesses. That's why they're weaknesses. You notice, this pawn isn't weak. It's really not. Now, white might have come up here to attack it. That doesn't make that pawn weak. That pawn is strong because it has this pawn to defend it. Okay, And I know this is chess basics. This is simple chess. But as we relearn the ideas of weaknesses, imbalances, etc., as we learn to practice to read this board, isn't it true right now, based on what I've said, you would rather be white than the black pieces? I would. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because white has opened better than black at, at this point. Okay, this is very interesting. Now, the center is open. and Now, I've said... When the center is occupied with pawns, then it's closed. There are pawns in this center, but they are not locked. They are not here and here. That would be a closed center. Instead, they're here and here. There's a chance of exchanges. They're not locked. So the center is technically called open based on this analysis what is the plan what are you going to do as white silman says go right up the gut right in the center and why not because this is the most important part of the board and you're set up at this point to where you can have a very strong game by continuing with your imbalance of a favorable development at this point and more space in the center. So why not keep going? There's no kingside attack in sight right now. Forget kingside attack. This position does not say, okay, now it's time to go for the king. No, you can't go for the king. That king is not weak. He has a wonderful pawn structure with a very powerful guarding bishop and a knight to boot. You're not going to attack the king and get anywhere. 
That's the wrong thinking. Continue with your central push and development. That's the plan. Now, at this point, you can see this pawn is threatening the bishop and that pawn. So we're getting some tension in the center. Things are starting to happen. How do you deal with this? Silman says there's no negatives. And based on the pluses that White has here in space and superior pawn structure sitting in front of him, White should be patient and just build up his game. How do you build up your game? Now, this is almost going to seem ironic what I show you next. When I went through this, I thought, oh, wow. Makes perfect sense. It's a beautiful concept, actually. The bishop is being threatened. Now, you don't want to just exchange the pawns. If this pawn takes this pawn, you know, and then this pawn takes this pawn, you're still guarded here by the knight, so that's not going to help you to exchange at this point. One of the best ways to continue build-up is to drop your bishop back down. And you go, wait a minute, you're moving a piece twice. Remember, you're ahead in development, though. So it's okay. I know the general rule is in the opening you never move a piece twice. But every chess rule is made to be broken. What does this second move of the bishop accomplish? Here's what it does. First, you're moving out of danger. But, and I know you're way down here, you would rather have a centralized bishop. This is why Silman calls for patience. You keep your eye on that weak pawn, don't you? Oh yeah. See, you've retreated, this is true, but you haven't lost any strength in this particular position because you know the weaknesses is here, here, and here. Two of your weaknesses of your opponents, you are still able to influence. So by dropping back, the piece stays developed and it stays useful. Right? Critical to understand. And the next follow-up move that White can do, addressing the imbalance now, remember you do have superior development and you do have more central space, so the next good move, based whatever black does, depends on what black, but for White's plan, you also want to pop that rook over on the e-file. And what this does you have the pressure here. You also now, you, you can bring your pressure to bear by bringing up the bishop and opening up the file. Because there's tension here in the center, right? The pawns are tense. By bringing the, the rook up, you have a potential for an open file. Now, of course, black is not going to simply hand you the open file. This is why you want to be patient, because Black, of course, is also playing in this game, and he will eventually do something like this. This is a central open file. That's a very valuable asset. Black's not going to just hand it to you, so expect this type of a response and a development. You see what I mean? So this is very interesting. And then, of course, if black tried to advance his e pawn to e4, like this, he says, the h2 bishop will gain even greater power. So you're stopping black's advance of his pawn. Because here, in this structure, black is limiting the diagonal for white, isn't it? So if black decides, I'm going to go ahead and keep going through the center, I'm going to keep pushing forward. And of course, he's threatening the knight. So I'm not saying this is a bad move. He is threatening the knight. Now, of course, you can, you can, you're going to have to move the knight. 
because he's got it guarded with this knight, so you can't just retake. You see that? In the process, so it, this is why you have to have patience, because as he presses the pawn, you have to get your knight out of the way, do something good with the knight, you know, pop him up here or something. Now, in the meantime, your bishop gains strength, because the pawn can't move back down. Once you move forward, you always got to stay forward. You know that. So this is some of the dynamic. This is some of the interesting uh, concepts that you can learn in reading the chessboard. Now I want to show. I'm going to reset the chessboard up, and I'll show you what White did that was a complete goof. Stillman noted that apparently <clears throat> these were two of his students that were playing, and he's using this as an illustration for us, which is very nice of him. I love you, Jeremy Stillman. You good man. In the actual game, White apparently felt that he had to do something now. Uh, he's in a rush. This is a hurry-up game. No, this is not a hurry-up game. There are no weaknesses. He has advantages. He has spatial pluses. He has a development lead. When you have this many advantages, you don't have to immediately go on the attack. The idea of building up your game is a much better strategy in the long term. Because these long-term advantages are not going to go away. Right? So he said what he did is he played knight to b5, which absolutely doesn't do a thing for his game. This does not address the central advance. This does not address the fact that he's better developed. It has absolutely nothing to do with the game. He's trying to get something going. And of course, e took f4. He threw his bishop away. Knight went to c7. Oh, sorry. This queen was here. Knight went to c7. So he's, he's looking for a fork, is what he's doing. I had this set up wrong. And then, of course, queen went to d8. And knight takes a8. So white got a rook, right? White got a rook. And of course, the knight got trapped because black went like that. <laughs> so yeah, he got a rook, but the knight was trapped. And it's an easy way to pick up the horse going to bishop b7. And eventually, uh, White did throw the game away because he was out there peace hunting instead of playing a solid informed game. So this is a good illustration of the value of reading the chess position. Now I've got another position I want to share with you that Silman shares. Now in this next example, Silman has us looking at this board. This is again between two of his students. And he says, don't bother looking for individual moves. What we want to do is figure out what White's correct plan is and also be aware of why you've made that decision. So when we look at the board, what are we seeing? Number one, we see immediately that Black is coming for a kingside attack, right? You can see he's going to keep pushing pawns. He has access to a file here with the, the rook. There's not a lot of protection right now about the white's king. From white's perspective, he knows what black's strategy is going to be. The pawns are pointing this direction, right? So this is the side of the board that he knows his opponent's going to play. Well, when we look at white's position, we see that his, his superiority is on the queen's side, so he's going to go for the queenside play, even though he knows his king is going to eventually be attacked. Isn't that interesting? How does he play? He immediately brings up the pawn to bishop four, b4. He is expanding his queenside. He is strengthening his queenside. He is working on the side of the board where his advantage belongs which is always the correct way to play chess, right? Black says, oh boy, here I come, honey. I'm coming and attacking you. White completely ignores it. Now, this is a lesson 
that is so hard to grasp because you're in the heat of the battle, it's a tense time, and your king is getting attacked. Holy crap! I've got to protect my king. I have to bring my stuff over. I have to bring my powers over to protect my king. It puts you in a defensive mode when you think that way. And it's not necessary. You have an advantage here. Work that advantage. White ignores Black's attack in this instance. There's really not a lot there. It's not directly threatening anyway. White brings his bishop to e2. Now this, coming back to here, he recognizes that because Black pushed this pawn, right? Black's on the attack. Yeah, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat this chump. In the process of advancing, he weakens the g4 pawn, so white pulls his bishop back, attacking that pawn, and by bringing his power out of the way, he allows himself to further advance the pawns you want to lead with your pawns on the queen's side. This is white's thinking, and it's excellent, according to what Silman says. H takes g3. Heavens yes, the attack is on. Does white freak out here? No, he does not. He simply returns. H takes g3. It's not a crisis yet. But the king is so weak. So what? Let the king be weak. Your strength is here. Right? Besides, technically speaking, the king isn't all that weak. He doesn't have a whole lot coming at the king right now. There's no reason to waste your time. However, Black is certainly announcing his intentions. He says, oh, honey, here I come. I'm going to get you. I'm coming after you. He's opened up the H file. And now, of course, it's obvious, Black's going to occupy that H file and come and try to attack the king. Use that as an attack. Does white freak out. No. He brings his rook to f1, giving himself a file. He also, because of Black's attack, he is also putting a clamp on f5. You see, he's got the outpost. The weakness here of Black is that this square belongs to white, and white alone. And it is on the king's side, so he's going to claim that square. Right? You see how that works? So, and his rook is more active this way. Well, here comes the black rook. Now, you know, the king's side attack is still trying to be developed. However, why worry about your king at this point? You do not have to freak out. He puts his knight on b3. He is mocking black. He's, he's absolutely laughing at him. He's saying, yeah, you've got an attack. You think I care? I don't give a squirrel's whistle about your attack. It's nothing. I have the superiority on the queen side, and I'm going to take advantage of it. This is the way to play chess. Silman is just thrilled with the way White's playing right now. It's really interesting to see it, isn't it? You go, wow, you know. Well, he brings his bishop up to h6. Now, this is an interesting move by Black. Because with the bishop here, it doesn't have the full range of its power. This is Black's bad bishop. Remember the definition of a bad bishop. If your central pawns are on the same color of square as a bishop, that's the bad bishop. It is limited in where it can go. It has technically no influence. So why not trade off your bad bishop for White's good bishop? See, White's pawns are on the white squares, so his white bishop is good, but is, is bad, but his black bishop's good. So black says, why not get rid of the bad bishop? Excellent. Very good move on his part. And white 
takes the bishop. And then the king takes the bishop. So you can see so far, because white didn't freak out, he knows the kingside attack is coming. He knows this is the play, the position, the place on the board where black's going to play. But he's not freaking out and bringing out over it bring them everything over here and ignoring his strengths, he's simply playing his game. This is important. This is a great illustration of that. Absolutely superb. And now, queen comes down here to d1. Black has a very bad game right now. And when you look at it, you say, okay, what makes black's game so bad and white's game so superior is because black has weak pawns here and here. And you say, well, weak pawns aren't that big a deal. Wrong. Weak pawns are a big deal. He has no support, so he has to defend that pawn. Well, he can't defend it. It's virtually weak, except for the bishop, I suppose. But this pawn is also weak, and someone has to stay home and babysit this pawn. Because of these weaknesses, and there are no weaknesses in White's camp, White has the better game. He's also got the superiority on the queen side, obviously. Very interesting. King comes back to g7. The bishop takes the g4. Now look at this game. Queen comes up to g5. Now, at this point, you're probably starting to say, uh-oh, here comes the pressure from black. Not so. He plays all of his final play on the hopes of doing a kingside attack. That's all he's got in mind. And white continues to ignore black. This is so fascinating how he does this. Bishop goes ahead and takes c8. He eliminates the bishop. Queen comes down here to e3 and goes, check. Now, are you freaking out yet? <laughs> what has white done? Did white throw away this game? No, white didn't throw this game away at all. Rook simply comes up to f2, blocking the check. The rook at a takes the bishop on c8. And now the queen comes up here to f3. Jin is what he says. Why? <laughs> this is so interesting because black virtually has nothing. It's a double threat because if queen, the queen threatens the, the queen on there and he also threatens to come up here and go check the weakness. Notice the weakness of the backward pawn that I just mentioned because he has that double threat of either taking the... Now the queen has to go, you see. In other words, he scored a full point because after queen takes f3, which was the only option black had at that point, and you can see the uh, kingside attack completely fizzled out, g takes f3, and now you can see that white clearly has the dominating position. He's got the space, He's got the powerful pawn structure, and he's got the... He basically went on to win the game is what happened. The king side attack fizzled, and White never did freak out and goof up his game because he kept at the power of his position and used the positive imbalances. He, in the end game, had the superior structure. You see that? This is a wonderful illustration of the power of knowing about the imbalances and working with your imbalances. Because he didn't freak out, in the long term, he never created weaknesses in his game. Black did. And it cost Black the game. <laughs> That's fun, isn't it? Anyway, those are two really cool illustrations. I'll have more for you here in a little while. Thanks for watching my videos, and remember, happy checkmating, man.